And I'm going to mention a story here, inshallah ta'ala, I want you to all listen to the story. This is one of the most saddest stories that the Muslim historians have written about. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Lahu Alhamdul Hassan wa Thanao Al Jameel. Wa Ashadu An La Ilaha Illa Allah wa Hadahu La Sharika Lah, Yaqulu Al Haqqa wa Huwa Yahdi Al Sabeel. Wa Ashadu Anna Muhammadan Abduhu wa Rasooluh Sallallahu Alayhi wa Ala Alihi wa Ashabihi wa Tabi'ina Lahum Bihsanin Ila Yawmi Al-Deen Amma Ba'd. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May Allah bless you all and write you Jannah to Firdaus and reward you for every step that you have taken to gain beneficial knowledge. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah gives me the strength and the ability to convey the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam correctly. And I ask Allah wa ta'ala that he forgives me for any shortcoming, mistakes or errors along the way. Inshallah ta'ala today, I want to speak about Usul al-Arab. The scholars, before they go into the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, they talk about the Arabs. To understand Nabiullah Muhammad more. Because without a shadow of a doubt, I'm guessing there is no one who doubts that the Prophet was, a, was an Arab. So we need to know about the Arabs. And so there are two things I'm going to focus on today at the beginning, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to go through after that. The first thing I'm going to talk about is Usul al-Arab, Ama Aqsam al-Arab, the types of Arabs there are. The second thing, inshallah ta'ala, that I'm going to speak about is the civilization that the Arabs have seen, has seen. The civilizations, Habaratihim, their civilization. So what are the two things I'm going to talk about? Number one is Usul al-Arab. If you want to call it Aqsam al-Arab, the types of Arabs. The second thing, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to talk about is Habaratihim. Habaratihim means their civilization. Once I do that, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to go and speak about the, the way that the Arabs were in terms of their religion. I'm going to talk about how their religious matters were before Muhammad ibn Abdullah came. The fourth point, inshallah ta'ala, that I'm also going to talk about is why did Allah wa ta'ala choose to make the seal of all prophets, Muhammad ibn Abdullah from Jaziratul Arab, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Arabs, okay? Because what we know in Islam, brothers and sisters, is every single action and every single speech of Allah has a wisdom behind it. Sometimes we know the wisdom. Allah tells us why. And sometimes we don't know the wisdom. But just because we don't know the wisdom, it doesn't mean there is no wisdom. Does that make sense? The Arabs are divided into two. The Arabs are divided into two. Number one is Al Arab Al Ba'ida. So those who want to write Arabic can write it. And if you don't understand Arabic, then inshallah ta'ala, I'll explain each word and I'll go through each point slowly. The first group is known as Al Arab Al Ba'ida. Al Arab. Al-Ba'ida. Al-Arab Al-Ba'ida means those Arabs who perished. They no longer exist anymore. And they perished before Nabiullah Muhammad came. They perished before Nabiullah Muhammad came. My translation may not always be the best of translation. I'm trying to roughly bring you the meaning. Al-Ba'ida means those they no longer exist anymore. And they ended existing or they ceased existing 
before Nabi Muhammad came. And they are the following people. Number one, Ad. Ad, that you read in the Quran, they are what? Arabs. And they are considered the Arab Al Ba'idah. The Arabs that don't exist anymore. Thamud. Thamud are considered to be what? Al Arab Al Ba'idah. They no longer exist. Al Amaliqa. Al Amaliqa. Al Amaliqa are also a tribe of the Arabs who don't, who don't exist. The third is Al Amaliqa. The fourth one is Basm. Ba, Seem, Meem. Basm. They don't exist anymore. Jadisa. Jadisa are also a tribe from the Arab Al Ba'ida. Jurhum. Jurhum are considered to be from the Arab Al Ba'ida. Who knows Al Jurhum? Put your hand up if you know Jurhum. Hey, what do you know about Jurhum? Mashallah. Jurhum were the people who lived in Mecca before Ibrahim came. Are we all together? Where did Ibrahim السلام, came, come from? He came from Al-Iraq. And who did he come with? His wife. Who was his, what was the name of his wife? Because he had two wives. Hajara. Sarah was what? She, Sarah had a maid called Hajara, and Sarah gave Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, she gave Hajar as a gift to who? Ibrahim. And Hajar was a gift given to Sarah by who? Huh? The king of Egypt. Remember when he wanted to do something bad to her, Sarah? And she refused and every time he wanted to go towards her, something happened to his body. And then he realized something is... What is this woman? And so he gave as a gift to Sarah, he gave her what? Hajara. And she gave Hajara as a gift to who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim had the first child with who? Sarah or Hajara? Hajara. What was the name of the child that she, she had for him? Ismail. And this maid Sarah jealous. And story historians, they mention a lot of stories. I won't go into that now. But he left Al Iraq. And where did he come to? He came to Mecca. When he came to Mecca, this is where he left his family. Inni askantu min durriyati biwadin ghayri di zar'in inda baytik al muharram Are we all together? And this is where the Zamzam water came out from. I'm just going to mention a quick benefit here. Ibrahim, when he said to his wife, and Hajara, you and Ismail are going to stay here. She said one question and she asked him this question. She said, Allahu amaraka bihada. She said, did Allah command you to do this? What was his response? He said, yes, Allah did. Then she said to him, then Allah is not going to forsake us. Brothers and sisters, we're talking about the desert. There is no air conditioner, there is no car, it is hot. We all know today, if our air conditioner in the car is not working, the way we feel. Look at the connection she had with Allah Azza wa Jalla. She said, if Allah is the one who commanded you to leave us here, then Allah is gonna, not going to forsake us. Ism Ibrahim also, how hard can it be to leave your first child that you've had at an old age? And your son, the Arabs, the son meant a lot. And to walk away from them.
was a challenge for him. The people who lived there were called the what? Jurhum. They're from the Qabila al they, they They don't exist anymore. When the Zamzam water came out, Jurhum, they drank the water. And Hajara used to charge them a money to drink the water. This is where she got a livelihood from. Allah will take care of you wherever you are. Allah will provide you subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَقَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيْرِ تَغْدُوا خِمَاصًا وَتَرُوحُ بِطَانًا If you rely on Allah the way you should rely on Him, Allah will take care of you subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the bird, it leaves in the morning with an empty stomach and it comes back and who takes care of it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the benefits that we take from this and this is how it should benefit us. These are the tr main tribes that are considered to be from the al qabail al Ba'ida. They stopped and they, they don't exist anymore. Okay, the second are called al Arab al Baqiya. They're the opposite of al Ba'ida. Al Arab al Baqiya are those who no longer exist. Sorry, those who they exist. Al Arab al Baqiya means they exist. Okay through Islam and they are two tribes two main tribes are considered to be from the Al-Arab Al-Baqiyah the first one are called Al-Qahtaniyun they could call the what? Al-Qahtaniyun that's the name that they are given they are also known as Al-Arab Al-Aribah Al-Arab Al-Aribah means they are the pure Arabs they're called what? al Arab al ariba The second is called al adnaniyun The second are what? al adnaniyun They're the second tribe from the, uh, the tribes that existed. al adnaniyun are also known as al Arab al mustariba Al Arab Al Musta'ariba, meaning they've been Arabized. They weren't Arabs before. And that is who? If you ever hear Al Arab Al Adnaniya, if you count the Prophet's name, the Prophet's name goes back to what? Adnan. And Adnan is the son, difference of opinion, if he was the son of Ismail or if there were 11, or some say 9, and some say others, other views between Adnan and Ismail. And Ismail, as I said to you, he was not an Arab. He came to, he came to what? He came to Mecca and he married from the people of Jurhum. And that's where they became Arabs. And Ismail actually studied Arabic from Jurhum. Jurhum taught Ismail Arabic language. And they studied and they learned. And his children then started to speak the Arabic language and they just became Arab speakers. The, they are called Al Arab Al Arab Al Musta'ariba and they are Min Dhurriyat Ismail. They are also called what? Al Adnaniyun. Is everybody with me or am I just talking to myself? Okay, I'm going to repeat it one more time. The Arabs are divided into two. There's, there's a reason why I want you to know this information is because. Later, when we speak about the Prophet Sirah, some tribes are going to hear about them in the battlefields, what they did, what they didn't do. Are we all together? We're going to hear who Allah is referring to in a certain ayah and why He's not referring to these people and etc. The Quran becomes more clear to us, the hadiths become more clear to us, situations in Mecca become more clear to us once we know the tribes and where they all stand. We all together. The Arabs are two types. Al Arab al Ba'ida, meaning the Arabs that no longer exist. And I mentioned they are Ad, Thamud, Ayyah, Tas, Judais, Al Amalika, Jurhum, and even Hadramut. Hadramut is also from the Qaba'il al Ba'ida. They no longer exist. The second types of Arabs is who? Al Arab al Baqiyah, the Arabs that exist. And they are how many? Two. The first one is what? 
The first ones are the Qahtaniyun. Al Qahtaniyun are the real Arabs, like the pure Arabs, they say. They're called Arabul, Arabul Ariba. They are. And in the Al Qahtaniyun, I'm going to mention who they, who they have inside there. They are the Arabs who live in the south of the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, the south. The ones that lived in the south are called the Qahtaniyun. Walidarika, some of the scholars, they either call them Al Qahtaniyun. Some school, scholars call them Al Arab Al Ariba. Some of them they call them Al Arab Al Junub, the Arabs of the south. And they are the ones in Yemen, Waman Hawlaha, and those around it. Okay? Walidarika, when you read the Quran, Lakadi kana li sabain fi maskanihim ayah, Jannatani ayamini wa shibal. Saba is who? They, this is the Saba is the people of Qahtan. The Qahtaniyun, that's a kingdom that they had. Are we all together? Allah talks about them in the Quran. We're going to touch on it later when we speak about their civilization. Saba. And also Ma'in. They are Qahtaniyun. Al-Lakhm. Al-Lakhm. Al-Lakhmiyun. They are also considered to be what? Al-Arab Al-Qahtaniyun. Are we all together? And the other tribe is... Al Jafna, I'm And I'm going to mention a story here, inshallah ta'ala. I want you to all listen to the story. This is one of the most saddest stories that the Muslim historians have written about. This is a very sad story. I'm going to mention it. Many scholars have mentioned this story. I'm, I have a bad habit of when I talk, I go to another information, I get over, information overload. So everybody remember where I stopped, okay? I'm speaking about what? Al Qahtaniyun. And in the Qahtaniyun, I mentioned what? Before I go to the story? I'm I spoke about how many people who are inside Al Qahtaniyun. I mentioned who? Number one? Saba, Ma'in, Al Lakhm, which is Al Lakhmiyun. And I then said, Awladi Jafna. Who are also Qahtaniyun. Now I want to mention a story to you. This is the story of the last of the kings of the people of Auladu Jafna. The last king. They used to have a kingdom known as Mamlakatul Ghasasina. I'm a Mamlakatul Ghasasina. The scholars they differ how they say it. Like in Mamlakatul Ghasasina. Are we all together? They are Qahtaniyun, the pure Arabs. The last king of theirs who ended the, oh, yani, this kingdom that was going on forever. And they used to, by the way, reside in Sham. Their religion was Christianity. They were Christians. And they were very rich. They were the ones who helped Ansar in Medina, Aus and Khazraj, against the three tribes of the Jews. They aided them. That's why the Jews in Medina were always in a weaker position than the Ansar. Ansar was stronger, even before Islam. Are we all together? Because Ansar, whenever they felt something, because Ansar are also Arabs. And so they were supported by this kingdom, which is Aulad Jafna, Al Ghasasina. The last king that they had, his name is Jabal ibn Al Ayham. He was the last king of this. And he was the one who ended the kingdom. And the way he ended it was he embraced Islam at the time of Umar al Khattab. Listen to his story. Jabal ibn Al Ayham, this story, Ibn Kathir mentions it in his Kitab Al Bidayah wal Nihayah. Are we all together? Jabal ibn al Ayham, he embraced Islam and he wrote a letter to Umar ibn al Khattab and saying, I'm going to come to Medina, I'm on, I want to take Islam. And I'm going to leave all of this behind. Umar became happy. 
and he was extremely happy. This is a powerful tribe with a powerful history of kingdom. They're known, ma'arufin. And they are not Arab al they are Arab al So Umar said, come, come to Medina and your Islam will be accepted from you. So he said, I'm going to come. He came and you know when a, the, the king becomes a Muslim, of course, he's going to bring all his people with him. So he said, Medina will not be able to take us. We are large in number. He bought 500 soldiers, all clothed in gold, silver, diamonds, and he put a crown on that was worth all Baytul Mal Muslimin of Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and everything. The day he came into Medina was a Yawmun Mashhud, a day where even the children and the women and everybody came out. It was shocking. He came into the city of Medina. And then he sat down, he came in, and ev the whole city, everyone came out of their house. It was, people were watching, power, strength. And he left Christianity like that. That same year, Jabal ibn al-Ayham, he said, Umar, I'm gonna do Hajj with you. He said, please, come and do Hajj with us. When he went Hajj that year, he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And a man from the people of Bani Fazar, he stepped on Jabal ibn al Ayham's ihram. King. You don't wear anything under your ihram, right? So when he stepped on it, Jabal ibn Ayham's aura showed. He put his ihram on and he slapped the man in the Kaaba. When he slapped him, his eye, yani he damaged his eye. The man could not see from his eye, one of his eyes. The people of Bani Fazar, they came wailing and screaming to Umar ibn Khattab. They said, Umar, this is what Jabal ibn al-Ayham has done. He slapped a man in the Kaaba, tawaf. Umar said, cool, Jabal ibn al-Ayham. Jabal ibn al-Ayham was brought to Umar al-Khattab. Umar said to him, hey, is it true that you did this? He said, of course I did. He said, okay, you have two options in front of you. The first one is, you either take this man that you've done this to, to the corner, you give him whatever money he likes, you and him come to an agreement, and you bring me this man happy. Or I will do to you what you did to him. Jabal ibn al-Ayham said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, I'm a king from the kings of Ghassasina. And I'm in awlad al-Jafna. And this man is nothing. Are you going to really do that to me, Umar? Umar said, yes. I will. He then said to him, إِذَنْ أَتَنَصَّرْ Okay, then I'm going to become a Christian again. I'm going to go back to Christianity. Umar then said, إِذَنْ أَقْتُلُكْ Okay, then I'll kill you. When he saw how serious Umar was, how tough the situation was, he said, give me till tomorrow. Umar radiallahu anhu said, okay. Tomorrow, no problem. Either bring this man happy or bring yourself forward and I'll deal with you. That night he went back to his, he, he, could, he never lived in Medina, he lived on the outskirts of Medina. So he went to his people and he said, all of you pack your bags, let's go. A very small number of the people said, no, we're not going to go with you. But the old bulk of the people of Aulad Jafna, they all packed their bags with Jabal ibn al-Ayham. And they all left with him. And he went to Rome, the Roman Empire, and he left Islam. He apostated from an Islam. Yes. He lived there for a very long time. Umar sent a letter to Hirakle. 
But Heracles is always called, the leader of Rome is always called what? Heracles. He wrote a letter to him and he gave it to a man from the people of Ansar. And he said, take this letter, Umar, and take it to him. And the Ansari man took the letter and he went to Heracles, the leader of Rome. The Roman leader, when he read the letter, he said, before I give you a response, go to your friend, Jabal ibn al -Ayham. And what the Roman leader did was, a portion of his kingdom, he cut it off for Jabal ibn al -Ayham. And a portion of land, big land, he gave it to him, money, anything he asked for, he gave it to him. So he said to this poor Ansari Sahabi, or this poor Ansari, he said, go and Go greet Jabal ibn al-Ayham and see how we've honored him and how you guys humiliated him. So the Ansari man went to Jabal ibn al-Ayham and he said, when he entered onto me, it was not a man I could recognize, the way he looked so young. And he dressed himself, was wearing gold and everything, beautified himself excessively. His hair was glowing of gold that he powdered, he poured on himself. And he came to me, he asked for wine to be brought. The Ansari man said, I don't drink wine. And he said, drink. He said, our Prophet Sallallahu prohibited alcohol. He said to him, as long as your heart is good, it doesn't matter what you do. My heart is good. You hear that a lot of people say that, right? Then he brought him, he said, I'm not going to drink this. So he said, just bring me water. He brought him water in a cup of gold. He said, I don't drink from cups and plates of gold. Give me something normal. So they brought him normal stuff and he drank. Jabal ibn al-Ahim drank so much alcohol that he was intoxicated. And he requested for singers to come and to sing for him. And he asked for the praise of his people to be read on him. And the poetry that they read on him, which they turned into music, was a poetry that Hassan ibn Thabit, the noble companion, the prophet's poet, had read for the people of Awlad Jafna, the people of Jab Jab Jabal ibn Layham. Are we all together? That poetry was the poetry that was being recited for Jabal, and Jabal kept crying. And then he looked at the man and said to him, Have you seen Hassan Muthabit? And he said, I have. He's blind now, he can't see. He said, this is what he read for us. This is what a poetry for us, the people of Awlad Jafna. Jabal ibn al-Ayham then said, how was Umar? He said, Umar has never been in a better situation than he is now. Islam has spread. The upper hand is for the Muslims. Jabal cried and he read the following poetry. He said, Tanassaratil Asharafu, yani he's saying that they've become Christians, the people. Tanassaratil Asharafu, min latmi, min ari latmatin, just because of a slap that Umar would have done back to me. And yani, Tanassarati means they became a Christian, the people, only because of a slap that Umar would have given them. And this yeah, and Islam would not have been any harm for them whatsoever. He said, Takannafani lajajun wa lakhmatun wa nakhwatun. All that took me was rage and anger. So I went into an argument with Umar. I didn't really need to. All he would have just done was slap me. Maybe an eye of my an eye would have gone, but I would have had the two eyes of Islam. I wish my mother never gave birth to me. I never came to this world. 
I wish I could go back to Umar and take what he said to me. I wish I could go back in time and I could go to يعني, the people of Medina, even if I have to be a maid or a servant or a slave for them. I can hold on to the religion which they are holding on to, the peace and happiness it brings them. So the man said to him, do you regret what you did? He said, I do. He said, will Umar accept my Islam from me? He goes, yes. Al-Ash'at ibn Qais and other people, they left Islam. And when they came back to Islam, their Islam was accepted from them. Rather, Al-Ash'at ibn Qais, when he left Islam, Abu Bakr married his sister off to him. Jabal ibn Al-Ayham said, okay, I will come into Islam. But I have two conditions. So what is your two conditions? So my two con conditions is, number one, marry, Umar would marry his daughter off to me. The man said to him, I can promise you that now, khalas. All it takes is for me to talk to Umar. Umar will let you, he will do that for you. Hey, second one is what? Second one is when Umar dies, he writes a letter for me, an official letter from him, that I will be the next leader in, in power. The man said, I can't promise you that. That's not in my hands. This is a matter of the Muslims. It's not Umar's decision by himself. And he said, I'm going to leave you now, I have to go. He left. He said, before you leave, take all of these gifts to Hassan ibn Thabit, his perfume and everything. And tell him, Ahlu ghasasina ama awladu jafna will never forget you, what you said for us. So he took all of the stuff and he came to Hassan ibn Thabit before he went to Umar. Hassan ibn Thabit before anyone came in, he smelled something. So he said to his children that were around him, I could smell something. And it, it seems like bukhur and perfumes that were brought from the Oulad al I know these people. So when the Ansari man entered and brought the stuff to Hassan ibn Thabit, Hassan said, are these stuff from Oulad al He said, yes. Jabal ibn al-Ayham, sah. He said, I read a poetry for him in praising his people. And he promised me that day that he will once, one day, he will repay us back. The time that Hassan ibn Thabit did this poetry for him, on the left side of Jabal ibn al-Ayham was Nabigat al-Dhubiyani. Nabigat al-Dhubiyani is one of the great poets of the Arabs who read, who read poetry and Hassan ibn Thabit read the, uh, poetry in praise of them. And so Hassan took the, pro, uh, the gifts and everything and the man went to Umar and he said, Umar, this is the response of the ruler Hirakle. And I also on the way met Jabal ibn al Ayham. Umar said, What did he say? He said that he said he's going to take Islam with two conditions. Umar said, Why didn't you agree to both conditions? He said, Both? He said, Yes. The second one, if he came to the city of Medina, inshallah, Iman will settle in his heart deeper and he would give up wanting leadership. But the first one, I would have done it for him. The man said, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to promise him both. So the man went back. When he reached al Qustantiriya, that's where the place where Jabal ibn al-Ayham was, a group of people who were walking came and he said, where are you guys coming from? And they said, we just came from the burial of Jabal ibn al-Ayham. And then he said, I realized that he died upon a bad path. Are we all together? So, what was the reason why he fell into what he fell into? Al-Ghadab, Wal-Kibr, Sah? Anger is not a good thing, brothers, Sah? And arrogance is not a good thing. Tawadu, humility is very important. He was like, how we, us, and this is what Islam came to destroy. Islam came to destroy what? That this person is better than this person. Are we all together, brothers? Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ أَن تُؤَدُّ الْأَمَانَاتُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ نِعِمَّا يَعِذُكُمْ بِهِ and he said, if you're judging between the people, you have to judge them with what? Fair, fairness and justice. 
وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعَدِلُوا وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَى وَبِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْفُوا If you say, say the truth, even if it's your close family member, صح? يَا يَا النَّاسُ إِنَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرِ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The best amongst you is the most righteous one. It's not my people is better than your people or your... وهكذا. This is the misunderstanding of us. وَلِذَلِكَ Brothers, underline this for the rest of your life. Anyone who gives virtue to a person because of where he's from is taking a... the path of shaitan. Why? Shaitan based virtue on where Adam was from and where he was from. Does that make sense? When he said, قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ عَمْ بَرَى خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ طِينٍ So we all together. But Allah based virtue on what? Not where you're from. But what you do and your hard work and your effort in Islam, that's what raises you. صح? We need to honestly get rid of all of these bad traits that we have. We have to understand if you do good, inshallah, good awaits you on Qiyamah. If you do bad, bad awaits you. How can one part of the earth that you're from, which has a certain color, be better than another part of the earth which has another color. How did one go virtuous than the other? صح? We all together, that's the, the difference is this the earth that you came from. So what is it based on brothers and sisters? Your actions and your hard work. Abu Lahab was who? He was the Prophet's uncle. And Salman al-Farisi was what? A Persian man, not even from the uh, Arabs. Who's more virtuous, brothers? So it's your hard work and your efforts, and this is what Islam came to get rid of. The second type of the Arabs that remained, Al Arab Al Baqiya, was what? Al Adnaniyun. And they are also called what? Al Musta'ariba. Yeah? Al-Adnaniyun are what? Al-Musta'ariba meaning they be, they've been Arabized. صح? They weren't pure Arabs. They had to learn the Arabic language at a certain point. And the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah was what? He was from them. وَلِذَلِكَ There is no known any Prophet that is from Ibrahim alayhi salam according to a lot of the scholars than who? Nabi Lahi Muhammad. Are we all together? يعني there's a khilaf قليل لكن the strongest and the biggest view is that Al-Adnaniyun the only prophet that is known for to be from them is who? Nabi Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So let's a bit focus on the Adnaniyun inshallah today and then I'm going to go into uh, the uh, the civilization the Arabs went through and then inshallah ta'ala I'll take your questions The Arab Al-Adnaniyun they resided in the what? The north. Al Adnaniyun. And they lived in Mecca. As I mentioned to you, Ibrahim came to where? Ibrahim came to Mecca. So that's where they resided. Okay? Ismail um, married into them, learned Arabic from them, and he had children who then started to speak Arabic. The mother who was a woman of Jurhum, she spoke Arabic, Ismail was learning Arabic, and she what? And she taught uh, Is Ismail's children Arabic, started to speak Arabic. Okay? Adnan, the Arab tribes started to come from there now. Arab al-Ariba, Adnaniyun. Okay? Who came from Adnan? Ma'ad, write this down. I'm going to ask you guys, inshallah ta'ala, a few days later, I'm going to ask these questions to you. Adnan came from him, Ma'ad. Okay? And then from Ma'ad came, came, came what? Nazar, right? And from that came 
his two children. He gave birth to how many children? Nazar gave birth to how many kids? Two kids. Rabi'ata and Mudar. I repeat. Adnaniyun is named after Adnan. Adnan gave birth to a child known as what? Ma'ad. Ma'ad gave birth to who? Nazar, right? Okay. Some say Nizar, some say Nazar, both are said. He gave, Nazar gave birth to how many boys? Two. Rabi'a and what? Mudar. Okay. The majority of the Arab tribes, these are the two you're going to hear. Rabi'a to Mudar. These two names underline it for me, inshaAllah ta'ala. Okay? And the famous tribes that are from them is Hawazir, Ghatafan, Tamim, Adi, and Quraysh. I'm going to ask you guys a question. What's the name of Quraysh? Is anyone here? Just put your hand up if you know it. Who knows the name of Quraysh? Who is Quraysh? Hayyah Fadl. What's your name? Huh? What's your name? Adil. Hayya Adil. Yeah? Fihr ibn Malik. Fihr, when you count the Prophet's name, later we're going to take this. Fihr is Quraysh. Quraysh's name is called what? Fihr. Are we all together? Quraysh, that's where it comes from. Those are the children that came from them. And last point, inshallah ta'ala, for today, and then I'm going to take the questions from you all. The type of residency and the way that the Arabs lived, the Arabs were two types when it came to how they lived. The first one, which is the bulk of the Arabs, is that they were Ahlu Bedouin. Ahlu Bedouin means that they were Bedouins. The bulk of the Arabs were Bedouins. Yani they were looking for yani the grass is green on the other side. So they traveled a lot. They didn't stay in one place. Does that make sense? And they're always on the move, on the move, on the move. And you tend to realize that a certain group of people are still like that. You tend to find them, they don't stay in one place. Because this is taken from the, يعني, from Ahlul Badiya. Ahlul Badiya are, that country is better. Really? Okay, let's go. Let's take our bags. But it comes in different ways and shapes and forms. Huh? The Bedouins, it was grass, but like in other people as well, business and jobs, right? Uh, same thing. So they're always traveling. You'll see them from one country, another country. So their children speak five different languages because they learn a little bit of language here and they moved on, they went to another language. Does that make sense? So that's the majority of the Ahlul Badiya. They're always moving and they're on the go. And this is the majority of the Arabs. The second one is Hadr. They're urbans, they're not Bedouins. They are urbans. They live in villages and cities and towns, okay? This one is mainly Al Yemen wa man jawaraha. The people of Yemen and those who lived around them, they were more considered to be Ahlul Hadr and Ahlul Badiya were generally the remaining others. Ahlul Yemen, the reason why they were more Ahlul Yemen, the reason why they were more urbans and not Bedouins is because they were neighbors of the what? The Roman and the Persian Empire. So they kind of picked up not to travel too much and they really did something smart, which is uh, they didn't need to travel a lot. They made what is known as the Sadd Ma'rab. It's the great dam of Ma'rab. They made a big dam where they held the water and they were able to utilize that water for their grass and their food and their cattles and their sheep and their goats. And Allah mentioned that in the surah. And when I speak about it later, inshallah ta'ala, Allah mentioned, لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَعٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةٍ جَنَّتَانِ عَنْ يَمِينٍ وَشِمَالٍ كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ مَشْكُرُوا لَهِ بَلْدَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ وَرَبٌّ غَفُورٌ فَاعْرَضُوا فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِيمِ وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَطْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ ذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُ
بما كفروا وهل نجزي الا كفر so this is what they were they had a big sad a big dam and they didn't need to travel a lot so they used to use the water from there i'm going to stop there inshallah ta'ala and i'm going to carry on their civilization and a bit about them inshallah ta'ala in our next lesson bi'idni lahi al-kareem and we're going to talk about uh, more matters related to that bi'idni lahi al-kareem uh, i wasn't able to go through the points i wanted to go through today but no problem inshallah ta'ala anyone who has any questions related to the class if we know the answers to it we will answer it and if we don't know we will say what sahib al maraqi said wal kullu min ahli al manahi al arba'a yaqulu la adri fa kun muttabi'a the four great imams of al-islam al-imam abu hanifa and al-imam malik and shafi and ahmed whenever they were asked a question and they did not know the answer to the question they would say la adri i don't know and it's never bad to say i don't know if you don't if you don't know so if you have any questions inshallah ta'ala ideally write your questions down on a piece of paper and just pass it over inshallah ta'ala it will be asked over here and we will answer it if we can inshallah ta'ala so we're mentioning the most authentic opinions inshallah ta'ala and that is also subjective sometimes sah? what is the most authentic opinion can sometimes be according to what I see to be what the scholars mentioned to be the strongest and somebody else might read that and say no I don't agree the authenticity of this or that so someone's asking the authenticity of some of these information the story of Jabalah Ibn Al-Ayham as I said to you, Ibn Kathir mentioned it it may or may not be authentic it may not be they're not, they, a lot of them they don't mention the chains for it but they say Man asnada faqad ahalik. If a person gives you the reference where it's in It's your responsibility to check and verify inshaAllah ta'ala Can you please re-explain Ismail's connection to the Adnaniyun? And Ismail alayhi salam, he gave birth to the Adnaniyun They come from him Adnan is from the offspring of Ismail alayhi salam when he married into the people of the Jurahima, Ama Jurhum, he had this child, uh, children from her, and that's where they became Adnaniyu, inshaAllah ta'ala. Did Jabal ibn al-Ayham die as a Christian? That's what the story says. And what about his people? Did they accept Islam after he died? A lot of the scholars mention this is where Umar radiallahu anhu, the reason why he wrote the letter was to open room. It was to call them to Islam and if not, Umar was waging war on them. How close in time were the people of Sabah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They were a very long time. But it's, they were between يعني, Isa and Nabi Muhammad. And the strongest opinion is that Isa and Muhammad, how many years is between them? The strongest opinion is that it's 500 years, so within that 500 years. So there's two opinions, someone asked a good question. The people of Jurhum, were they already live in there, okay? And they resided there And Ibrahim, some scholars, that's what they say. And some say, no, people of Jurhum came by and then they saw the water here and that's when they... Why did the Arabs al-Ba'idah stop existing? Because Allah destroyed them. The people of Ad and what? Samud, we're going to talk about them. When he spoke about their civilization and what type of people were, Allah mentioned in the Quran, كَذَّبَتْ عَادٌ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ هُودٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ مِنْ أَجْرِهِ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ أَتَبْنُونَ بِكُلِّ رِيعٍ آيَةً تَعْبَثُونَ وَتَتَّخِذُونَ مَصَانِعَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَخْلُدُونَ وَإِذَا بَطَشْتُمْ بَطَشْتُمْ جَبَّارِينَ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ وَاتَّقُوا الَّذِي أَمَدَّكُمْ بِمَا تَعْلَمُونَ أَمَدَّكُمْ بِأَنْعَامٍ وَبَنِينَ وَجَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ Allah mentions them in the Quran, sir. So Allah destroyed them, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the same with Thamud and all of them. Some scholars do mention, some said, someone asked a question, they said, was there a wisdom behind why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was from the Arab al-Musta'ariba rather than the Arab al-Ariba? Some scholars, they say yes, to show that everybody should give importance to the Arabic language, even if you're not a, an Arab. And this is something Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah mentioned. The Nabi Muhammad being from Arab al Musta'ariba shows that even though he wasn't originally Arab, his people originally, that every single person should what? Should try to give importance to the Arabic language 
because I say this a lot of the times, brothers. The Arabic language is not the Arab, it's not the language of the Arabs, it's the language of the Muslims. Arabic is the what? It's the language of every Muslim. So when you become a Muslim, if you weren't Muslim before and you embrace Islam, give Arabic the first importance, even before your own mother tongue. Does that make sense? Why? Because the Arabic language is the Arabic of the Muslims, Muslims, Muslims. Does that make sense? Because our Quran is in this language. We're all together. And when I talk about why Allah chose Nabi Muhammad to be from the Arabs, you'll learn, you'll understand why. Because when the scholars, they speak about the Samiyun, the Samiyun are the cement, cement, what's called the Semitic languages, right? Yeah? Yeah, languages, which are the what? Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Amharic, the Arabic. The only language they say that did not get affected, that if you looked at their language today, that they go back to the purity of the language of Sabi ibn Nuh, they say, is the Arabic language. All other languages got infiltrated, changed. And the, reason is, and the reason to that is because how Allah was protecting the Arabian Peninsula from people coming and mixing with them and changing them and etc. The Arabs only started to change when Nabi Lai Muhammad came and the scaling was not based on ethnicity and background. It was based on what? The Arab would marry a non-Arab. Everyone was marrying each other. And then people started to speak grammatically wrong. And then the Arabs were like, hmm, maybe we have to put grammar down. Maybe we have to maybe write the Arabic grammar and to protect this language from any changes. So someone asked a good question. They said, why is sometimes the scholars they refer to the seerah as maghazi? Just the same way they refer to Qiyamul Layl as Qiyam. And it's not just Qiyam, it's Ruku' and Sujood and all of that in there, right? There's a Qa'idah according to the Arabs, which is Dhikrul Ba'ad wa Iradatul Kul. Mentioning something, but intending the whole thing. So we say Qiyamul Layl. Qiyam means standing, right? When you're praying Qiyamul Layl, are you standing? Are you not doing Ruku'? Are you not doing Sujood? You're doing all of that, but just a portion of it is mentioned. Um, so Maghazi is battles. So the person may say, why is the seerah just referred to it as battles? They're just mentioning some of it, intending all of it. Does that make sense? Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. Subhanakallahumma bihamdi wa shadu wa la ilaha illa Allah.